Hello, everyone. This is Henry Schneider with the Business Performance Podcast. And today, it's my pleasure to talk with Don Schaefer of the Athens Group. Who's the, this is a company that's been around for 21 years. They're constantly reinventing themselves, but now they are focusing on the oil and gas industry for improvement in cybersecurity. So, Don, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so Don, to begin with, what I'd like for you to do, since probably most everybody here doesn't know what the Athens Group is, just if you could give us a brief introduction to what the, the Athens Group does, your type of customers, and the products and services you deliver. Absolutely. Uh, we started out here in, uh, in Austin in 1998, um, six of us who had worked together before at uh, either in semiconductors or uh, in consulting firms here in Austin, sat down at a, uh, a local pub called the Draft Horse, took out our checkbooks, and each one of us wrote a check to start the company. Mm -hmm. And we had decided at that point that we were not going to take a penny in salary until we started making money. Um, fortunately for us, we, uh, we started out pretty pretty fast with a uh, fairly large contract from SBC at the time of the Southwest Bell or Southern Bell. And, and from there on, we, we grew. Um, it, was, uh, it was an interesting, interesting process. Today, we're focusing on oil and gas industry. Uh, we're our main office. We've moved from Austin to Houston. Our clients are, we're, we have every one of the major oil companies as a client of ours. We have offices and teams working in, um, in Russia, the Caspian Sea, uh, offshore Africa, offshore Brazil, the Gulf of Mexico, and Australia, and every once in a while, Korea and China. Mm. And uh, we are really the, the software engineers we, we don't write code, per se, unless we absolutely positively have to, but we do the verification, validation, testing, installation, integration of, uh, of the systems that are offshore. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, that a lot of people don't really know, is if you're familiar with semiconductors and you look at, at what it takes to build a semiconductor fab, uh, it's about a billion dollars in costs to put one of those together. And an enormous amount of software is used to put it, hook it all up. An offshore oil and gas rig, a uh, semi-submersible, a drill ship, is also going to cost you about a billion dollars mm -hmm. and has more code than what a semiconductor fab has. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an amazing, an amazing process. And, and we've, uh, we, we've come to both love it and hate it. Yeah, my, my son worked for Transocean for a while on a drilling ship out there in the Gulf. But when the price of oil dropped down, they started shutting those rigs down. Yes. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the issues within the industry because really the corporate knowledge that is there doesn't reside in BP. It doesn't reside in Exxon. It resides in the drilling contract. Right. And, and the drilling contractors are in a constant state of bidding, and they have to be the lowest bidder. Well, that means that as soon as there's a blip, they lay everybody off. And, you know, this is like a consulting firm. Every night, your corporate knowledge walks out the door. Right. Yeah. And that's what happens there. Yeah. Yeah, and this whole thing there, you know, even... And it's just not just like Transocean, but you've got all the other contractors, Oceaneering, everybody else that feeds into that, provides all of the services so BP can have a will. That's right. Yep. And it, it's, it, it's amazing the large number of people and, and, and who's involved, all the way down to small contractors who were spinoffs from NASA who make sensor sets that go on steel cantonary risers. Yeah. And and there was they built one and then decided they didn't want to be in the business, yeah. but it's got a lifetime of years. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you've got those um, uh, robots that go down to the ocean floor, mm -hmm. put the uh, blowout preventer on there. Yep. And, and the other thing that I always find fascinating is the, the directional drilling that you're able to do. They can yes. drill down, go sideways, and a couple miles, drill down, and come back. 
I don't know. I mean, it's just, I guess it's differential speeds on the bits that they can able to direct where they're going with that stuff. And, and there's a lot of that, but there's also, it's, uh, it's surprising. We did a lot of work in Wyoming with the fields up there and, and they do a set of directional drilling. They'll, they'll pour a pad and then they'll drill 21 wells on that pad. And they basically do a clock pattern. They'd go down 2,000 feet and then make a 90 degree turn and go out. Hmm. Well, in order to see where they were, they were, they were literally guys in Airstream trailers with, with grids that they'd lay on the ground of uh, cabling and brass poles that they drove into the ground. And that's how they would do their magnetic steering. And, and if you've ever worked with antennas and developed a Smith chart, you realize that, that it's about 15% science and 85% magic. Yeah. And, and that's how they make it work. And it, it's surprising. It really does work. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. There's, um, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the TV show on Netflix, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. It had a whole, yes. bunch of, and where um, Tom Watt, Watt, Watt is out there prospecting for gold and the, the pattern he puts on the side of the river to zero in where the, the mother load is. Yep. Same thing, yep. right? Yeah. <laughs> It, and it's amazing. The, uh, and, and there's some people that know how to do that. And, and there's, you can't automate it. You can't build an expert system. There's no machine learning involved. You got to suck that out of their brains and it's almost impossible to do it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So now the next question is thinking about the your oil and gas clients. What's the importance of quality, quality to what they do that you, from what you deliver to them? Well, I, I think it, it's really important. In in 2012, we got our first um, ISO certification. We're, we're ISO 9001 certified. At that time, we got a uh, 2008. ISO 9001, and, and there are a number of quality certifications, uh, it, it's pretty much required to do business in the oil industry that you've got one of these certifications. What, what we found amusing, and, and a lot of us have a great deal of experience in semiconductors, is that the ISO 9001-2008 was completely geared towards manufacturing. Mm -hmm. If you weren't a manufacturer, it was hard to use. When 2015 came around, we waited a year until, the, until it stabilized, and then we converted over to 2015, which is all risk-based. Uh -huh. And that's basically how we did, we would do our work anyway. Very much, we always look at risk, we measured risk, we, we have lots of models on how we look at threat, threat analysis and risk. So it became very important and, and we were very happy to see ISO finally catch up to how we did work, which was a, which was a good thing. So quality is critical and, and what you have to be able to do is where we found oil and gas as opposed to some other organizations, and I'll give semiconductors as an example, Semiconductors quality became a checkbox. Mm -hmm. You know, here's here's the 20 things you got to have, and once you check those, go away. Don't bother me. I don't want to hear about it again. In oil and gas, we tie together quality, safety, health, and the environment. Really do a QHSE approach. Safety, you can't do anything on the rigs unless you address safety. Yeah. Once we tied quality and safety together and started ringing threat analysis, it became very clear that, that was the approach to take. So yeah, it, yeah, we couldn't do our, we could not do our job. We'd be out of business tomorrow if we didn't have the quality. Yeah, so that okay. brings to mind the Deepwater Horizon disaster, where you know they said, forget the process, just keep drilling. You know, right. Well, there there were a number of of problems with the Deepwater Horizon. What was what was ironic was there were a number of very high-level BP managers on board. Mm -hmm. They were on board because they were presenting a safety award mm -hmm. to the Deepwater Horizon. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, you know, that was one thing. They had done, they had made a grave mistake in not checking the quality of the concrete. Right. So when you talk about 
where are they going? You know, this is concrete. I'm pouring concrete. I'm pumping it down a hole into the ocean, you know, and it's going through a large pipe. And then it's going out thousands of yards till it gets to this junction. And then it's going to fill itself in and be, be okay. Yeah. And 90% and of the time it works. Unfortunately, the Deepwater Horizon was one of those temperatures that they didn't check it. The other thing was they shut down the alarm system. Mm -hmm. So when when they started taking a kick, and a kick is basically where a big bubble of gas is going to come up through the well, yeah. the, the well pipe, and it was methane, and it started flowing over, it came out of the shaker tables and started flowing over the deck, they had turned the gas alarms off because they figured the well was ready to go. Yeah. When that exploded, that first explosion, I had a uh, uh, a friend of mine who who was an electrical technician from um, from Transocean. He was in one of the lower equipment rooms when the explosion hit, mm -hmm. and it blew it blew debris against the door. He couldn't get the door open. Wow! So there's always kick panels in the back. Every room's got another. You can, there's another way to get out, yeah. and he. Kicked that, got out of the way. It was blocked, still blocked, but he got out of there. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was interesting. The, you know, the they didn't, they had a false assumption that everything was safe, mm -hmm. and and they were wrong. Yeah. Also, there were a couple of things that that Transocean did. Um, Transocean had a policy of no knives. Couldn't carry a knife on uh, on their rigs. You know, oh. probably a good idea because. If you go back and you look at the statistics on the number of injuries and what causes the injuries in the oil and gas industry, the number one cause of industry injuries are knives. Mm. But four guys had jumped off. They were down on a, uh, a life raft. They, the life raft was tied. It was, and the knot was in, and they didn't have a knife to cut the rope. Ah. Some fishermen were coming over. And luckily, one of the fishermen threw him a knife, mm -hmm. and they cut it and got away. Yeah. If not, they would have been killed. And it is just, you know, the the unforeseen circumstances. Right. Yeah. It's it's all context dependent. You know, what what you need. Um, I remember year, years ago when we were working the space station, we were talking about caution and warnings, and yep. my, my boss was saying, "Well, okay, if you drop soap in a shower and there's no water, no problem." The water's on you got a hazard <laughs> yep absolutely yeah it's uh it's very much uh, very much contextual and it's it's surprising how many times we we almost overtrain people mm -hmm. in some respect yeah so what are one or two of the biggest misconceptions out there when you're working with the oil and gas about quality and performance i think one of the the biggest misconceptions and, and they're in two, two areas. One of the biggest misconceptions in the management of, of the oil and gas, and, and this is in large, both large companies and, and uh, drilling contractors, the, within the companies themselves, the people who are actually in exploration and production have this idea that software is just a nice to have. Mm. That that you know we we had we did a presentation several years ago and the title of it was Would you like software with that? <laughs> and because it was an afterthought, they they didn't think it was worthwhile, and they didn't realize mm. until after we killed a number of people because of software problems that they finally decided that yeah we better take it seriously. But even today, I think offshore oil and gas is still around. 1975 as far as understanding software yeah that that sounds like nasa too at the space shuttle when i first started working on it, they said software never fails <laughs> and, and the first flight was delayed because the software failed <laughs> that's right yeah they got yeah, the countdown yeah i, I think the, the 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 term that the, the phrase that i always used was um software never wears out yeah. It's delivered broken. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And there's also there's always that myth, too. Well, software, that's easy to fix. Hardware yeah. takes a big deal. But, you know, 
software. Oh, we'll fix that. We'll get it out and put a patch and make it work. I think one of the, you know, the interesting, I, I spent a uh, number of years and I worked for Motorola, um, AMD, and uh, Crystal Semiconductor in, in Austin. And, and managed some pretty large projects there, was a director of engineering. And, and one of the awards that we're most proud of was from Apple. And we built the audio systems, a number of award-winning audio systems in Apple products, the, the original iMac and several other ones. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it was so solid and worked so well were there were no software drivers. Uh -huh. We did everything in hardware. Mm -hmm. And there was no chance. And, and at the other extreme with Intel boxes, when we were providing, um, we were providing saw, we were providing chips and things to either Dell or Intel or anyone else. We had, I had 60 guys who were programmers that did nothing but write drivers for Microsoft. Mm. And, and we had one guy at Microsoft full time. And, and the software was just a disaster <laughs> at times. And we tried to put as much into the hardware as we could. Yeah, yeah no, no, that's that's the thing is, yeah. I, I remember, you know, you know, growing up through the NASA community, you know, you, you were in, all the proper disciplines were instilled. We were trying to mm -hmm. use 2167 and 2168. Oh, well, yeah. Going out into the commercial world, all bets are off. Nobody wrote requirements down. Nobody spent any time designing anything. They just say, let me start writing code. Bang, 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 bang. That's right. That's right. You do it, you do it, you do it, you do it until you finally get it. Yeah. Yeah, there's... You know, in, in, in software, there seem to be there. There's never enough time to do it right, but there's always time to do it over. Right. And, you know, Agile was supposed to fix that, but <laughs> it only made it worse. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I used to refer to Agile in, in presentations we'd be given as Agile's hackers with shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, if you do Agile correctly, it requires more discipline than the waterfall. Yes, it have, really does. A really good scrum master in there is going to hold everybody's feet to the fire, make sure they write the user stories. Yes. And then, and then do decent planning and estimating instead of this, um, you know, planning poker, which to me is just is just all bets are off. Well, this this feels like an eight. No, nah, this feels like yeah. a fifteen, and it's all gut feel. It really doesn't help. Oh yeah. Hey, one of the other things about at Agile, and we've done a couple of projects full agile, multiple people, multi-million dollar projects. And and the one thing that I like about agile, even though I joke about it, is I can understand what the technical debt is. Mm -hmm. And and one of the problems is getting the users, the users, it, it's right in front of their face. Every week mm -hmm. you go through uh, go through everything with them, redo user stories, and they see exactly what it's costing them and what a change is going to cost them. Yeah. And the best projects we did, our technical debt was equal to the total amount we spent on the project. Uh -huh. But it's always there. Yeah. And, and that's one of those things that, that I think users almost don't like it because they want to bury it. They don't want their bosses to know. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's probably the best part of Agile is that I'm, I'm concerned is I can, I can look at my technical debt. Yeah, the visibility. But Agile is also like, a, and this, is, this goes back to my NASA days, too, is like, bring me a rock. Yeah. Like, Here's a rock. Well, that's the wrong rock. You come, yeah. How about yeah. this one? Nope. You keep bringing a rock every, every two weeks, and you finally get a rock and say, yeah, that kind of looks like what I want. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, could you share a story how you helped one of the companies overcome these obstacles and succeed? Yeah, I think one of the... One of the, the things we were we were able to do, and, and this was on a, a fairly recent project, we, we're in the process of, of upgrading in drilling control systems. Drilling control systems are most, mostly Siemens PLCs, programmable logic computers, um, used for machine control, but there's always a server network around them. Um, up until about, the early 2000s, many people were using Sun, still using Sun workstations as the servers. At that point, they switched uh, 
to Windows-based machines. One of our clients has got five sites where we're, um, we're going to be upgrading everything to Windows 10, and it's the new Windows 10 IoT, the Internet of Things, which is a skinny down system. So we went to them and said, what we want to do is, is on the first of these five, we want to make sure that you've done your failure mode effects and criticality analysis, an FMECA, standard risk analysis. Hadn't been done because, you know, it's just software. <laughs> and, and so we, we did that and we went back to both the, there were three people involved. There's a hardware vendor who, who ended up being acquired by Schlumberger in the middle of all this. There was the drilling contractor who's the U.S. based, uh, and then there's the there's the major, the oil company major, and then the uh, the group that is a conglomerate of these guys that all work together and in, in where the drilling was taking place. So we went and said, look, we really want to go through this process. They said, you know, it's overkill. I said, no, it's not. Here's the risks. Here's what you need to do. And we went through a full risk analysis for them. And they said, okay, we'll let you do it this time. We think it's a waste of money. <laughs> we went in, went through all the processes. When we went to do the installation, they had budgeted 11 days for the installation, testing everything else. We did it in three. Now, the cost of a day is about a million dollars a day. Mm. So we saved them $8 million on the first one. But that was the first one. As we do the rest of them, we're going to go through the same process. And they've already cut back their estimates because they know it's going to be better. So they're going to be able to get back up and productive faster. Mm -hmm. So in doing this, they will have saved close to $40 million. Mm -hmm. and, and the investment in what we did was... Two hundred and fifty thousand, three hundred thousand dollars, and and it it seems so so easy to get them to understand that, but it's only easy if your clients, your customers, understand the benefit of doing risk analysis, doing these upfront failure modes, looking at at these processes, and understanding that software is the most expensive thing they have in their rigs. Mm -hmm. So what's the, what's the moral of the story, if you could, if you could condense it down? Uh, the moral of the story is respect your software. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had done a series of uh, presentations that really irritated a bunch of uh, equipment manufacturers because the title, of my, uh, the title of my presentation was Software Kills. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it got their attention. Because before, they, you know, software was that thing that didn't always work on their phones or is that thing that was on their desktop. You know, I, I look at people who are, you know, people who are our age, and we are, 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 they've retired from the oil and gas. So we've got, we've got people who are probably 10 to 15 years younger than we are, who I would think, and, and I've got a, you know, I, I think everybody understands software. Why wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. We still have managers that are in their late fifties who have admin admins who print their emails out for them and they make notes on their emails and then the admin returns them. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's not, you know, when you were talking is make you know, I was thinking here, you know, the the demographic of the people that you work with in oil and gas, a lot of them come out of the blue collar think without having that technical background and mm -hmm. it's, it's the Peter principle they get promoted to the highest level of incompetence yep well and, and it's what they're rewarded for they're rewarded because they they keep the drill bits turning to the right mm -hmm. they know which piece to grease they know how to make sure that when they they do all these processes on the drill floor they're they get done right and and in give them the, the due respect they deserve, they really do understand that stuff. And it, but it's a mechanical orientation. Right, right. And, and, and these guys are, I mean, they can really get the job done. But if you want to sit down and talk to them about how we want to come in and test all the alarms on the system, they'll go, we just turn the damn things off. We don't listen to them. Yeah. I can look out the window and see what's going on. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I know talking to my son, he, I mean, he was on the path to, to go all up and eventually become a rig manager. And he said, I don't want to be a rig manager. That's an office job. I want to be out there and hands on and work in this. And I was working as a company man out in Colorado in Bass. Uh -huh. And he's still, he's out there monitoring what's going on and checking on the, you know, again, it's all hands on. I mean, it's, a, you know, great stuff, but, you know, being able to convert that over into technology is where the bridge has got to be built. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, and, and land drilling is, you know, a completely different world than, uh, than offshore. Yeah. And in land drilling, there's still, um, there's still areas that aren't even using blow off preventers. You know, there's still areas that there, there is no automation on the rigs. They've still got mechanical and hydraulic rigs. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so, um, so what are some of the common pitfalls or mistakes that, um, you, that you have to keep in mind when you're working with the oil and oil and gas? Well, from, from the point of view of from a uh, supplier-customer relationship, we we constantly have to understand that we've got all the technical skills down. We know all this stuff. The most critical skills for us are the soft skills. If, if a consultant goes in who is just, you know, the smartest guy in the world mm -hmm. and goes in and, and irritates the customer because they're talking down to the customer mm -hmm. or they can't run a meeting mm -hmm. or they can't, figure out how to get consensus, you're done. Yeah. And, and people in oil and gas, I mean, it's still a small community. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the people that I know in oil and gas, people that I met 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, some people that I knew before that who moved into oil and gas, you know, that they're still around. They have really long memories. <laughs> and, and they'll say that, oh, remember that, that, guy who came in from PwC who thought he knew everything in the world and didn't even own a pair of steel-toed boots. <laughs> it, it was interesting. There were, there were a couple presentations that I made that I made sure, even though I wore a, a, uh, a suit, I had, a, I had steel-toed boots on. You, you just, you had to understand how to fit in. And you, you know, how much you knew did not matter. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Listening to my son tell stories, and he would come back off a shift about you know how some of these guys would come out, and nobody has any respect for them at all. And the guy wanted a piece of the core that they had drilled out, and so they just gave him some kind of junk. <laughs> <laughs> junk off the table, off the shaker table. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it's it's also interesting. You have to understand a lot of the people that are there. One of the times. I was going out in a work boat, instead of taking a, a chopper, I was taking a work boat from uh, uh, Port Fouchon in uh, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And I was getting all my stuff together and talking to the folks in the boat. And all of a sudden, the sheriff comes up, the parish sheriff, mm -hmm. with a van. And out comes guys in orange jumpsuits. He unshackles them, and they get in line and go out and work on the rig. Wow. They were the floor hands on the rig because they couldn't get enough enough people. Mm -hmm. And and these guys were nonviolent mm -hmm. criminals. They had passed all their drug tests and everything, and they would go out and they would they were still making hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred dollars a day. Mm -hmm. Half of it went back to the parish, and they kept the other half went into a bank account for them. Mm -hmm. But you know, you never know. You're you're bunking with people on a rig and you don't know where they came from <laughs> but you can pretty much pretty much bet they they didn't go to oxford or cambridge yeah okay so let's talk about your backstory a bit what defining moment happened for you that led you to where you are today well i think the the defining moment for me was uh when i realized at uh when i was 17 years old that uh, based on what was going on in the world, um, if I didn't do something that would get me a lot more discipline when I was in college, I would be drafted and uh, I, my next step would be in Vietnam. So I applied to uh, my congressman for a, uh, a slot at a military academy and ended up 
going to the Air Force Academy. So I, I jokingly say I went to the Air Force Academy because I was avoiding the draft. But that was that was really the defining moment. I, I realized that I had been a, a good student all the way through, but I many times didn't take uh, a lot of the important things seriously and tended to do, uh, party a lot. Mm-hmm. And those four years uh, instilled both the discipline and the real real learning that I really learned how to learn. And I think that was one of the important things and, and realized at that point, uh, what we know today is that uh, the way technology changes, I was going to have to be a life, lifelong learner. So luckily, um, although I cut down on my partying tremendously, I learned how to do that uh, at a very early age. I think that was the, that was the defining, you know, the defining moment for me that really set me on my path. Okay, and kind of a follow-on question. Could you share an experience that you had growing up or, in, you know, all the way through your career that still influences how you approach business today? I think one of the, one of the important um, experiences that I had was when I was, um, I got out of the Air Force and went to work for Boeing. And and as I went in, uh, luckily, so this is um, early 1970s, uh, went in on the AWACS program, the Airborne Warning and Control System program. And, and at that point, um, there weren't a whole lot of folks that had, that had engineering degrees and also had computer background. And I'd taken computer courses and my, my bachelor's degree, um, in engineering, I was a uh, uh, I was focusing on geodesic engineering uh, as a geodesist. So the guy that figured that I knew right away how to calculate where you were on the Earth because you knew the Earth was in a sphere. And so those were that was interesting. And, and I think going in there, and I I went right in as a team lead. I was probably the youngest guy on the team, but I was the only one who who just gotten out of the military. And and I realized that. The management style I learned in the Air Force was was transferable to the civilian world because being an officer in the Air Force, as I went to my first um, duty squadron, the uh, chief, the uh, sergeant major called me in and was talking to me, said, Lieutenant, I want you to remember one thing. You're in the Air Force. In the Air Force, only the officers die. Mm-hmm. So don't, you know, Treat enlisted people with a lot of respect because they're the ones that are going to keep you alive. <laughs> and I realized that, that I always took that forward working in the civilian world and realizing that, that everybody was important. And especially in a large organization like Boeing, it's very important. Sure. Okay. So thinking about today now at the Athens Group, what are your top three process or business capability challenges? I think the, the top three for us, number one is to continue our, our quality programs. That it's always easy for engineers, managers to slide back and not do the quality programs. We, we set it up so that all our quality programs are online. Uh, everything is, is automated. It's available everywhere um, on, uh, on the internet, on, on our systems. And, and as one of our, uh, our last auditors said, it's, uh, you know, when, when he finished the audit, he said, your, your system is amazingly robust and it's not, you know, you're not going to, uh, not going to break it anytime soon. Second challenge for us is to ensure that everybody is safe. I mean, we've got people on helicopters, we've got people offshore, we've got people onshore in shipyards. Um, we're in an area where, where safety awareness has to be the most important thing anybody worries about. And, and the idea of situational awareness. One of the things I try and instill in everybody is the idea of situational awareness. Understand where you are, understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. Don't... Don't think you're any place safe. You could you know, walk through a hole in the deck. You could get hit by something being dropped. Right. And then I think the, the third one is to 
is to keep in mind that we're a resource for our clients. We're, we're a technology resource. And the only way we can help them is they have to accept us and we have to treat them as, as partners and not as someone who we have to educate. We don't have to educate them. We just have to treat them like partners and understand the role they play in what we're trying to get done. Okay, wonderful. So the, the first one you were talking about your quality system being available online. So um, do you have any issues with people being able to get, you know, connect when they're in some of these foreign countries like China? Uh, actually, we don't. And, and most of what we do is we, we use a series of tools for our quality system. Uh, it's called Traction. Mm -hmm. For having all our documentation for a project, uh, we use Dropbox. Oh, okay. Before anybody goes out, we've, for every project, we've got a multi-page project quality plan. Mm -hmm. So everybody signs off on it. Everybody's busy. And part of that plan is you download all the documentation and uh -huh. all the project information you need on your laptop. Okay, ahead of time before you. And have. we do all that ahead of time, so that if and and we usually don't have connectivity. There's there's rigs that we work on, especially mm -hmm. off Australia, where there's one satellite phone. Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I well, know. I mean, it's, you know, connectivity is a big issue, and I know I've, I've done a lot of work in China and. Mm -hmm. All things Google don't work because yes. of the censorship wars. And yeah, and, and it, it, yeah, it's a real challenge. We do uh, we do quite a bit of work in the Caspian Sea, so we're in uh, Baku in Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. and and it's the same same issues there. The uh, the the infrastructure once you leave um, BP's building or Exxon's building or somebody else. You're out of luck. You're not going to do work in your hotel room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so what does success look like for the athletes today? Success for us is is working on um, more and more of the rigs that uh, that are being you know reconstituted. There's still a large number of rigs from the last downturn. Mm -hmm. uh, also, for us, it's it's we do quite a bit of work on the blowout preventers, okay. doing the assurance that the blowout preventers, all the, the software is working on them, the systems are working, and also that they've that the maintenance is done. So we'll we do for several majors, we handle all the between well moves in the North Sea. And we do the same in the Caspian. So when you unhook that BOP and bring it back up on the deck. At that point, you bring in the hydraulics guys, you bring the mechanical guys in, you bring the electrical guys in, and we work with them to make sure that every one of those trades goes through what they have to do and that we've got all the latest equipment because you're going to be replacing valves, you're going to be replacing rubber goods, there's all kinds of things that you're going to be doing. So, so uh, success to us is, is making sure that our clients are successful and finding lots of oil. Okay, wonderful. So, who's your competition in this space? In in many cases, our competition is is usually internal. Oh. It's it's folks within the uh, within the drilling contractors. Oh, okay, yeah. Who who say we've got that covered? I've got guys that know that they've been certified, so on and so forth. And and what we end up doing to overcome that is we're usually working with the duty holder. Now, in our case, the duty holder is the major who is responsible for that well. So we'll work with the BP, Exxon, uh, Eni, Total, <clears throat> Marathon, so that they basically have to tell the drilling contractor, no, you're going to work with these guys. Okay, yes. So, so that's one of the majors. The other one is um, a lot of the class societies: Lloyd's Registry, American Bureau of Shipping. Mm -hmm. um, a number of those people have, uh, and in fact, a number of them have actually acquired companies very similar to us. And then what happens is once they get into 
working, they realize that they can't have access to a lot of the information because it's proprietary. They can't go out and use some of the things and, and they just quit. Mm. So we do see that, but it usually happens that, that uh, and there's some individuals, there's some smaller companies, okay. two, three person companies that work on some of the rigs that have built up relationships over the years. Sure. But, but, there, but the majority of our competition is really internally with drilling contractors, getting them to understand that you, you really do need somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay, so you, you've got, you're working with all the majors. Are there, are there any um, oil companies that you have not worked with that you want to work with? Um, hmm. I'm trying to think of, uh, of any we haven't worked with. I think there's still, there's some uh, Knox, some national oil companies mm -hmm. that uh, we haven't worked with. We would love to work with uh, uh, Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Vietnamese, okay. they're they're both doing a lot of a lot of work. Um, India is another one mm -hmm. where they're doing a lot of work, but they 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 haven't they haven't gotten the pressure that an Exxon has or some of the other companies have. Yeah, they're just, they're just waiting for a disaster to happen. I know they are, right? Yeah, and and many of them have already had disasters, and they they just don't get reported. <laughs> I think there were two. There were two Indian jack-up rigs that exploded last year, or in the last 12 months. Mm. So, and, okay, so if they were to come to you, what questions should they be asking of you to be able to, to understand, to evaluate you against what they can do internally? I think the, the main question they want to ask is, tell us your experience with, with other contractors, or with, with other majors. Um, we found that although there's a lot of things that are proprietary, we bring a lot of experience with us. We, we pretty much now understand the best practices for these majors. So if, if you're a, you know, if you're a, a Chinese oil company or you're um, Indian or uh, someone who has not had a lot of exposure to how majors do business, we can, we can help you understand that, and especially in the area of of defining and mitigating risks that you know I, i'd ask you know, what can you bring to us that's best practice in the industry and how do you make sure we don't fail mm -hmm. yeah. okay great so um final question here if you had to start athens group all over again after the 21 years and the constant reinventing what would you do different today and what would you keep doing well, I think that that what I would what I would do the same was was find a group of people who will sit down at a table and have the vision and commitment to make the company work by getting their checkbook out and writing that check. And I think that that's the key. You know, the six of us all had skin in the game. Yeah. And and that was the most important. I think what I would uh, what I would do differently than with Athens was I would start out not being a code shop. Uh -huh. We wrote lots of code, and and at the end there was always you know the clients were were happy. We were always 100% referenceable, but they always had issues with the code mm -hmm. somewhere along the line. Mm -hmm. So I would start out from the very beginning as a strictly an engineering firm. Okay, great. Okay, Don, we're running out of time here, so I'm going to be conscious of what don't take too much of your day. So um, I've enjoyed your stories. It's been great. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? The um, easiest way to get in touch with me is, is either um, contact me via LinkedIn. Just, you know, that's one of the easiest ways. Uh, and it's Don Schaefer on LinkedIn, or send me an email, Don Schaefer, D O N S H A F E R at Athens Group, one word, dot com. And, and also, Schaefer is, is the shortest spelling. No, no extra Fs or Cs. I had extremely lazy ancestors. <laughs> they, they anglicized your name, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think they uh, they they chopped it off to begin with. The uh, the only you know they even threw the umlaut away. <laughs> well, great. Okay, so um, thank you so much for your time today, Don. This has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Henry. I appreciate the opportunity and it was was great chatting with you. Hope to do it again sometime. Great.